Hello everybody in the chess world. Today we're going to see the double fianchetto playing against the English uh, opening. And so, well, I've said this before about the English, but normal, normally when we see the, the English opening uh, players, they usually play that opening all the time. I mean, it's understandable. Let us take for an example. Um, okay, let us play my typical modern or King's Indian against the English defense. I'm talking about this typical English with this, with the light square bishop fianchetto, d3, knight f3, and castles. You know, this typical scheme. So, they play this all the time. It's hard to surprise these opponents. And, for example, in here, you know, castles, knight c3. Let us say c6 to oppose this uh, good bishop. Rook b1, knight bd7, b4. I mean, we've seen... You know, this typical plan of just playing b4 and b5, playing on the queen side. Okay, we can say that in the center, black is slightly better, but there's no not a clear action there. There's no harm done, you know, at any point to this uh, white king. I mean, it's really understandable and really solid. Of course, there are stuff like uh, I've seen this uh, blitz game by Morozovic uh, on YouTube. I'll leave you a link in the description, but he played e5 and after g3, h5. And... <laughs> course with the idea of just playing h4 opening lines immediately it's my kind of uh, game with the black pieces not so simple though so some time ago i found out that well the double fianchetto against the english opening is really really solid and also we have of, of course the uh, you know, opportunity of getting an advantage fighting for for the win so let us say you know normal scheme will be like this c4 b6 White is already seeing that we're going to fianchetto this bishop. We're talking about this typical fianchetto for white as well. So let us say knight on f3, bishop b7 and g3. And now we go for the hypo, you know, the double fianchetto. Bishop on g2, bishop on g7, castles and knight on f6. So this knight on f6 is an important move. If we think of the normal double fianchetto, we might think about such moves like this, because the typical plan is, I think you know this, is like this, and then black plays h6 and a6. So this is not a pure hypo, you know, it's a double fianchetto, but now knight on f6. I think this is important, because this way we are already 100% control in the e4 square. So, in a way, this is really solid for black because we can force a lot of exchanges, but mostly, you know, like domination of the key squares. So, the absolute main move in here is d4, and I am going to focus on this move. But just to, you know, illustrate this thing about the the light squares and the e4, in the e4 square, you know, let us say that white plays knight on c3, and they have the idea of playing with d3, not with d4. More like in what, what I show initially. So for now, just castles. And now after d3, well, on the next turn, white might play e4 if they want. So before they do that, another reason to have both the bishop on b7 and the knight on f6 already controlling this square. Because now we have this d5 upon. I think it's really important. And for example, I saw a game with bishop on g5. But now we already advance and win the, the space. Knight b5, c5. And the game follow rookie 1, a6. You know, knight a3, knight on c6. It looks like black is already slightly better. Of course, white could play with the schemes with d3, but it's not so easy. Again, we're always ready to play d5. Also, it's not a hypopotamus, you know, with d6, e6, you know, this dull thing. I actually really like that opening, but not in this case. So, if after knight on f6, they go d4, well, of course, more than ever, we have total control of this square. So, you know, the, we're going to just play castles. And now the main line is knight on c3. For example, I saw this uh, Alf Anderson playing against Spielmann. And Alf played e3. So, Spielmann went e6. And Anderson went, went for b3, like imitating a little bit this uh, double fianchetto, but with the white pieces. The game followed d6, bishop on b2, knight bd7. You know, it's a really easy play for, for black. We don't have to worry about anything. The same thing goes for white, but yeah, the white English players are used to that. Not necessarily us with black. Knight c3, and we're going to see a lot of this move. You know, once white 
places the knight on c3 we oppose that knight and we try to exchange it so after knight takes and bishop takes well you see we already have this first exchange and now if at any point this knight move moves we will be able to exchange the other bishop so we're going to have a really well peaceful action you know we don't have to worry about uh, anything from white so for example uh, this game went immediately knight on e1 we saw bishop takes and knight takes this again is anderson against spielman and c5 hey you know what is what remains in the position well my bishop on g7 is kind of uh in you know in slight domination of the bishop on b2 let us take the advantage to, to play c5 they cannot advance the pawn so okay rook b1 came c takes e takes in e5 you know just not waiting even for development or for anything going into the action immediately and the game follow pawn takes pawn takes and knight on e3 rook e8 so this is a small example but this position is already equal now going back we came from this position and we're all play uh, e3 but main move is knight on c3 and once again once that knight places himself there we just play knight on e4 going for the exchange so here the main line is queen on c2 let us first check again what happens after the exchange of, of these two pieces and for example in here d5 is one try uh but knight on a6 it's a nice move uh because otherwise it looks like or well, where is this knight going okay we might play d6 to put it on d7 because he cannot go on c6 to c6 well but just knight on a, on a6 is fine and in one particular game white play knight on d4 okay allowing again once again the exchange of pieces but at least the knight on d4 looks kind of well however c6 came i think now the game continued e4 because the thing is the idea is if white takes twice well we simply have queen on c7 nothing more simple than that right like i don't know uh, queen d4 uh, knight d4 queen takes d4 and now not only the material is equal now black is much better the position has opened white's king is more exposed we have a good development and we have both rooks ready to come to the open uh lines uh, files so um, pretty cool um going back we were here and we were looking at knight takes bishop takes instead of this d5 i saw a game with bishop on e3 maybe a good idea but d5 black we can, can always po play positionally so white when queen c1 to try and you know get this typical exchange of the um, solid protecting uh, bishop you know black's bishop on g7 oh c6 really solid um rook d1 knight d7 this is uh matamoros versus tiviakov and bishop on a6 rook c8 uh, king bishop takes king takes and after queen c3 a logical move to place the knight uh, the queen on the same diagonal as this king well tiviakov even played b5 why not <laughs> i mean and after b3 and e6 they agreed on a draw so it's funny the only one who made some kind of active move and unexpected move was tiviakov with b5 okay whatever was the move for him in that game this was a draw but a rather black and this is totally fine now going back after knight on e4 i said that queen on c2 is the main line but again is all the simplifications come here come here because knight takes e3 is our move in here this is quite simple um i'm gonna have to recommend uh i guess i'm gonna have to recommend b takes e3 both moves are are theoretical and playable but after queen takes e3 obviously we have this c5 once again whenever there's a pin from one of our two fianchero bishops we try to take advantage of that and after logical e3 bishop on e4 this is a move more like you know, on the queen's indian move um i mean one of the basically we want to play knight on c6 but you know without blocking our cool bishop we want this b7 bishop to be ready to be exchanged for the most important uh white bishop in case the knight on f3 moves because otherwise you know why this not paralyzed but it's you know whenever they move something to start to get into it, the action well we either exchange pieces or and make things really solid we just don't let them uh do anything quite active so I, that's why i really like bishop on e4 and it's very difficult to um actually disturb this bishop on e4 that, that is why it's, it's 
an unexpected move, but once you, we see it, it's easy to explain. So b3, now knight c6 with the bishop outside of the pawn chain. And again, there is not even d5 nor anything. We're, uh, sorry, d5 by, by white. We're like this. It's, it's, again, it's, white feels um, a little bit, um, I don't know, like out of action, you know? <laughs> so rook on d1, uh, I mean, of course, if, if we play normal development move, this is the other thing with the bishop on e4. Well, now we're just ready to exchange. Win a pawn, I don't see why not. Um, just exchanging in queen of c7, this pawn up for nothing. Okay, they have the bishop against the, the knight, but it, it is a pawn up. So going back, instead of bishop on b2, rook on d1, adding another force to the c d4 pawn looks more logical. And even here, I think this was a real game. Uh, I don't have the name of the players, but this was suggested just bishop takes in d5. So again, it's... Um, we see a lot of, of these lines in which black is the first to to be active with with some particular pawn moves. So searching for squares, for some positional advantages, possible advantages with the pawns. It's quite interesting. So going back, we were in this uh, main line, queen c2 and knight takes on c3. So b takes c3 will be, I think, more recommendable than, than queen takes on c3. This way the queen doesn't put herself in the diagonal of, of our good bishop and well i mean okay yeah there's now there are two pawn islands for for white but at least they have this well they're taking towards the center i don't know if the b file is so important maybe one day but at least they they've taken towards the center however there are double pawns and this line uh, this is something that i'm pretty interesting in, in, in this because okay um you'll see it immediately this time, after this big takes c3, we played more cautiously, just on g6, e4, this is logical. But doesn't this pawn structure remind you of some other opening, you know? We go now on c6, logical bishop on e3, and now, just knight on e5, yeah, the Nimzo Indian, this is like the Nimzo pawn structure for white, so... As black, we have the same kind of plan. We just go knight on a5, we want to harass the double pawn that is advanced. Of course, then we want to play as in the Nimzo Indian, just bishop on a6. It won't be easy to protect this pawn. In this case, black is actually looking for an, an advantage, clearly looking for an advantage. Also, there is um, always the possibility, the possible plan of just going for e5. This is totally playable. But I like this much more because you, you see knight d2, Again, we're going to start to see some actions by white in which they, are, they have to worry about that c4 pawn. But bishop a6 comes, you know, anyway, just attacking c4. Queen d3 and c6. And it's, as in a lot of lines in the name zone, and it's a little bit already too late for white to, to really be able to protect that c4 pawn. Um, rook fe1 has the idea of making bishop on f1 possible, but... Hey, again, it was already too late. Knight takes e4, and knight takes e4, d5, with a clear advantage in here for black, because we're just going to be a pawn up for nothing. Uh, we haven't done anything weird or particular, but it's it's funny. We already have this advantage here. So uh, pawn takes, pawn takes, bishop on g5, hitting on e7. Well, um, we can even afford to make some maybe weird moves. I mean, bishop takes e4, of course, it's not a weird move, this is a natural move. We effectively take the extra pawn and hit in the queen, but after the queen goes, and they are still hitting on our e7 point, well, now we play the kind of weird move, f6. So bishop on e6, queen d6. And there's them, I mean, why try to, to, to get some sort of advantage for, uh, advantage, sorry, compensation for a pawn in here, but they weren't able to. I mean, the game followed... Bishop takes, king takes. Okay, now, now they want to prevent e5 because otherwise black will lash out and will have everything. So they play e4. Uh, but simply e6. So again, white went for rook e3, trying to gang up on that e6 pawn. Black made, you know, logical rook a8, rook a1, 
and just rook e7, making sure that then we're just going to play rook f e8, then this is typical from a lot of games of, of chess, you know, this technique. Uh, okay, we already won a pawn, we just want to be really solid on our, one of basically our only weakness, which is our pawn on e6. If we can solidify that forever, then we'll be free for our own action and try to impose that extra pawn. So in the game, Bishop f3 came, for example, if you want to, I don't know why white will want to play h3, but let us say h3 to play, I don't know, maybe someday g4 getting something, well, that will be already a mistake because h5 not only tries to stop a possible g4, well, now we're just threatening to play h4 and undermine the pawn chain, so... Again, white should be careful about their technique, even try and draw, trying to draw this game. So bishop on f3, rook f8, f8, as I said, you know, now bishop on g4, but the pawn is protected enough, well enough, h5, bishop on h3. Finally, we have everything solid. We don't even need to play king on f7. That's a good detail. So b5, you know, queen f2, a5. Finally, finally, with, yes, we kind of trying to keep an eye on the e6 pawn, but already expanding on the other side. And I think this is already like really a clear advantage for black. It's like their extra pawn is just for nothing. So I think it's, it's really interesting because the first thing that we get with this double fianchetto, this particular line, and remember, is not the pure hypo, you know, hypopotamus. You know, in, the, in here we play knight on f6. Remember to try and get the grip of the light squares over the center. Uh, otherwise, as I said before, you know, no more normal hypo will play it like this, you know, and I see three, six, a little too passive. But it's really, really cool because initially we get a really, really, really solid position, uh, having all the, you know, um, desirable exchanges available for ourselves. And then as you saw in some particular lines, well, why has, has to be careful, otherwise we can get some advantages. So. Okay, this is not the only thing that I'm going to show you and recommend for you all to play against the English. Because the thing is, I really have seen, uh, I think, in the English opening was always trendy, but it's such a safe um, opening for white, such uh, so easy to learn. And you can play that all the time. You'll always play the English. So we see, yeah, a, a great amount of players going always for the English. So that, that is why I want to offer you different stuff. That, that is why in the, you know, in the intro I offer you, you know, like this crazy Morozovic H5. Um, but first of all, I really like as a reliable uh, option against the English, this double fianchetto. And remember, you can get also a lot of chances to get an advantage. And definitely... I mean, it's, it's rare for me to see white having nothing, you know, all of these lines that I show you. It's like white rarely has anything to show for, you know, so it's really cool. So thanks a lot again for, for watching. I'll leave my cat Citroneta to ask you to like, comment, share, and subscribe uh, the video. And I will see you the next time. Thanks a lot.